저는 지금 우리 대학생에게 있어 가장 중요한 문제는 먹고 사는 문제, 즉 실질적인 경제적인 문제가 가장 중요한 문제라고 생각을 합니다. 대학을 졸업하면 80%가 부채자이고 또 이태비라고 해서 20대 태반이 백수라고 하는 이 시대에서 저희 숭실 테드는 대한민국의 가장 최초 금융 테드를 표방함으로써 여러분들께 경제 분에서 다시 경제적인 그런 분야 분야에서 가장 전문가 분들을 모시고 여러분들께 그런 실질적인 아이디어를 나눠주고 싶습니다. 본격적으로 시작하기 앞서 저희 승실대학교 배우자학부의 엘리자베스 허트로 교수님을 모시고 축사를 진행하겠습니다. 교수님께서는 한국인이 아니라 외국인의 입장에서 어쩌면 가장 객관적인 그러한 시각으로 여러분들께 강연을 해주실 거라고 생각을 합니다. 박수로 맞으시기 바랍니다. 박준석 Son Ye Sung, and extra special help from Yu Nyu Jin, and of course, of course, all of the organizations who have brought us here today. Uh, SUIBS, the Sung Shil Student Union, and the University Investment Club. Without those people, none of us would be here. And let me say, I'm very impressed to see so many people here on a Friday night. You could be out at a restaurant having a beer. But instead, you've chosen to come here and listen to lectures about finance. But perhaps that speaks to the power of TED. Clearly, every one of you knows what TED is. You know that TED has changed the way we share information, the way we learn. It allows us to hear from the greatest minds all over the world. And here at TEDx, we have an opportunity to hear from some great minds from right here in Seoul. Now, when Park Joon Suk came and asked me to speak, I don't consider myself a great mind, and I'm certainly not an expert in finance. I didn't know what I could give to all of you. But as he told me about the concerns of being a student in Korea today, the problems that students have with finding jobs, the stress in your lives, I realized maybe I have something to offer. Now, a long, long time ago, 2001, I was at the University of Michigan. I was a business school student. As far as I knew, I had done everything right. I was at the, one of the best business schools in the country. I had an amazing internship. I had gotten good grades. My friends did the same. And in the winter, we all had job offers. But things went bad in the spring. In my summer, it was rather bad. And half of the students in my class lost their job offers. They had moved to New York, moved to Chicago, moved to Los Angeles. They bought apartments and cars, only to have the company call and say, I'm sorry, you don't have a job. That's pretty scary. Now, where are my friends today? Where is the class of 2001? That's not them. They're not homeless. And that's not them. They aren't working at McDonald's. They're very successful. They had a very hard time, but they're doing just fine. Many of them are at their dream jobs. They're back at Bain, they're back at McKenzie, they're at investment banks, they're at Deutsche Bank, they're at JP Morgan. They're doing what they dreamt of doing. But many of us aren't doing what we dreamt of doing in university. And not because we couldn't, 
but because we learned something from those years of difficulty, something that changed our lives. So I'm here to perhaps give you three lessons that I learned when I couldn't get my dream job. First, there are a million paths to success, not just one. Second, there are a million definitions of success. And third, obstacles, difficulties, can teach you more than any success. All right, so I'm gonna tell you about some people I know who studied business and finance, maybe. Can I have my slides back? Okay, this is Dirk Siebold, a good friend of mine. We were uh, friends in elementary school. Our parents are best friends. We went to Disney World together. We have the same birthday. But in high school, Dirk and I weren't very close. I was going to a math and science center. I was vice president of my high school. I played varsity tennis. I was on the perfect path to being successful, I thought. He was dropping out of high school. He quit, didn't finish. Four or five years, I don't know what he did. But then somewhere along the line, he found his goal and his passion. He finished high school. He got a four point in university. He worked some, but he independently passed all three levels of the CFA. And at age 34, he owns and operates his own hedge fund. He lives on a huge house on a lake. He works a lot, but it's his time. When he wants vacation, he goes on vacation. He is one of the most successful people I know. And his path was nothing like the path you would expect. There are a million paths to su success. This is my friend Jason, the white guy. <laughs> Jason went to University of Michigan with me, and he didn't have any trouble in the job market. He worked for Deloitte Consulting for five years. He could have moved on, been in management, but his definition of success changed as he got older. Today, Jason works for the United States Park Department. He travels from different national parks, helping with their business plans and their efficiency. And when he's having a really good week, he gets to go to Africa. He's in Rwanda here. Now, financially, Jason is not the most successful person I know. He gave up money for his job. But let me tell you, his job is awesome. Imagine if that was your office every day. All right, and then there's one more person. Jason defined different options for success. And our last person learned a lot from an obstacle, from a difficulty, from a failure. Me. <laughs> now, I'm not the most successful person I know. Uh, and I'm not successful in the way I thought I would be when I was in university. In university, I was going to start in accounting, move on to consulting, after consulting, go to corporate. Corporate fast track to the top. I was going to be a CEO, maybe a CFO. I was going to have power, prestige, respect. I was going to have money. But then the economy fell, and I could do accounting, but I didn't love it, and there were no consulting jobs. So I took some time and worked at nonprofits, and I learned a very important lesson. I learned that for me, power, prestige, and even money were not as important as being happy. So from nonprofits, I went to graduate school in public policy, and from graduate school, I learned I love to teach. And then here I am today. And I'm maybe not financially the most successful person in the world, but I love my job. I'm passionate about it. Because I love my job, I have a plan for my future. And every year I'm moving further forward to make my life and my career better. So I like to think of that as my own personal success. And it came 
from my own personal failure to get the job I thought I wanted. <clears throat> All right. That is at our beautiful soccer field here at Sumsho. <laughs> All right. Now. Oops. Oh, don't see that. Now, I'm not saying give up your dream of being a banker. Whatever your dream is to be an investment banker, a consultant, we have engineers out there, that is great. You don't have to go be a teacher or a park ranger like Jason. But I am saying that it might not work out as soon as you graduate. You might not get your perfect job. And I want to give you a little advice about how to deal with that. Because it's not the end of the world. Two things. Get off your couch. Do not be depressed. It's OK. There's not a problem here. You're young. You have time. And the other one may be a surprise. Get out of the library. For students, the library is a safe place. If I'm in the library, I'm working or sleeping. But the library is time for you to be finished with the library when you graduate. Stop studying from books. Stop learning from books and start learning from life. You're too old to hide in the library. Even if your mom thinks it's OK, the rest of the world knows it's not. You need to be brave now. So let me recommend that you get out and you live a little. Go get a job in a smaller, medium-sized business. I know, the terror. But there are hundreds of thousands of jobs in Korea in small and medium-sized businesses. In those businesses, in the first year you're there, you can get more responsibility and more leadership than you will in five years in a major company. That is an outstanding opportunity to make yourself more marketable for a big company. Or better, start your own small business. You're young, you have energy, you're not married, I think. No children. <laughs> this is the time to try your own company. If you succeed, maybe you're the next Mark Zuckerberg. If you fail, well, you've learned so many things. Business, confidence, innovativeness, creativeness. You are a better employee because of it. All right, so my message to you is go out and do something. If you don't get your perfect job, that's fine. And maybe, just maybe, you'll learn more from your, part, your small business job, more from your own entrepreneurial experience than you could have ever learned in your perfect job. Now, to take you into a little advice, I have a video from a success expert, according to Ted, Mr. Richard St. John. Don't worry, Korean subtitles. This is really a two-hour presentation I give to high school students, cut down to three minutes. And it all started one day on a plane on my way to TED, seven years ago. And in the seat next to me was a, a high school student, a teenager, and she came from a really poor family. And she wanted to make something of her life. And she asked me a simple little question. She said, what leads to success? And I felt really badly because I couldn't give her a good answer. So I get off the plane and I come to TED. And I think, geez, I'm in the middle of a room of successful people. So why don't I ask them what helped them succeed and pass it on to kids? So here we are, seven years, 500 interviews later, and I'm going to tell you what really leads to success and makes Tedsters tick. And the first thing is passion. Freeman Thomas says, I'm driven by my passion. Tedsters do it for love. They don't do it for money. Carol Coletta says, I would pay someone to do what I do. And the interesting thing is, if you do it for love, the money comes anyway. Work. Rupert Murdoch said to me, it's all hard work. Nothing comes easily. But I have a lot of fun. Did he say fun, Rupert? Yes. <laughs> Tedsters do have fun working, and they work hard. I figured they're not workaholics. They're work-a-frolics. <laughs> Good. 
Alex Garden says, to be successful, put your nose down in something and get damn good at it. There's no magic. It's practice, practice, practice. And it's focus. Norman Jewison said to me, I think it all has to do with focusing yourself on one thing. And push. David Gallo says, push yourself. Physically, mentally, you've got to push, push, push. You've got to push through shyness and self-doubt. Goldie Hahn says, I always had self-doubts. I wasn't good enough. I wasn't smart enough. I didn't think I'd make it. Now, it's not always easy to push yourself, and that's why they invented mothers. <laughs> Frank Geary. Frank Geary said to me, my mother pushed me. <laughs> serve. Sherwin Newland says it was a privilege to serve as a doctor. Now, a lot of kids tell me they want to be millionaires, and the first thing I say to them is, okay, well, you can't serve yourself. You've got to serve others something of value, because that's the way people really get rich. Ideas. Tedster Bill Gates says, I had an idea. Founding the first microcomputer software company. I'd say it was a pretty good idea. And there's no magic to creativity in coming up with ideas. It's just doing some very simple things. And I give lots of evidence. Persist. Joe Krauss says persistence is the number one reason for our success. You've got to persist through failure. You've got to persist through crap, which, of course, means criticism, rejection, assholes, and pressure. <laughs> So the, big, the answer to this question is simple. Pay 4,000 bucks and come to TED. <laughs> Or failing that, do the eight things, and trust me, these are the big eight things that lead to success. Thank you, Tedsters, for all your interviews. <laughs>